Hey everybody, welcome to Community Conversations here at Atlantic Health System. My name is Luke Margolis, I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health and I will be your host for today's program. Uh, and today we are talking about something quite timely, although really there's probably no bad time during the year to talk about screening for colorectal cancer, uh, but it is Observance Month uh, in the month of March and to hear, here to help you understand a little bit about why we think this is so important to talk about is a good friend of the show and somebody who is actually making his second appearance on these? Second appearance, that's right. That's right, so you know he's gonna be good at it, is Dr. Matthew Grossman. He is a gastroenterologist and interventional endoscopist. He is also the chief of GI uh, here at Atlantic Health System. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so we are, look, folks, uh, if you're new to Community Conversations, I'll, I'll let you know this is very much your show as much as it is ours, so please feel free to submit any questions or uh, if you want any clarity on anything we've covered, just type it right there on the screen. If you miss any part of it, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where you can find this program and all of our other community conversations, and you can find out more, of course, at AtlanticHealth.org. Um, okay, so we've got a number of questions that were sent in ahead of time. You might not be surprised to know, Dr. Grossman, there's um, a lot of similarity between the questions I have and some of the ones that were submitted. Um, you and I have had a chance to do some media lately, and the reporter questions were similar to some of the ones we've got today. So it's a little bit of well-worn ground, um, but I think it bears repeating. Um, we're here to raise awareness, of, uh, first of all, to talk about the, the, the treatments we have, but the awareness about the screening options that are available for folks. In your opinion, how important is the screening here? Why, why is it so important we're raising this issue for folks to focus on this month? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you're asking. Uh, it's super important because um, for anyone that deals with colon cancer, uh, the name of the game is early detection, right? Uh, colon cancer um, is uh, preceded by precancerous lesions, known as polyps, mm -hmm. um, more specifically adenomatous polyps. So polyps with that term adenoma in there, those have the potential to become cancer. So if we do a screening procedure, find an adenomatous polyp, remove it, we're preventing that potential, we're preventing the possibility of that becoming colon cancer one day. So um, very few cancers give us this uh, forewarning, if you will, and um, I think uh, it behooves us all as physicians, as educators, as media stars to, um, to uh, make the public aware that this is an option for them, it's available for their benefit. What are the different types of screening modalities that are available for folks? Because it, I think in, in our conversations, it sounds like it's an ever-developing science and, and area. What are the best options we currently have for people right now? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll come out and say it. Uh, you know, the guidelines do say that there are equivalent options uh, amongst many types of tests. But the gold standard is colonoscopy. And the colonoscopy is a camera uh, that is uh, inserted into you mm -hmm. while you're sedated. Uh, it's a painless procedure. Uh, enters into the rectum, ascends through the colon to the very beginning of the colon called the cecum. And then there's a slow withdrawal. And on that withdrawal, the doctor looks around behind every fold looking for these precancerous polyps and resects each one that they may encounter. Um, so colonoscopy uh, is the gold standard because it doesn't just diagnose cancers and polyps, but it can also treat them um, at the same time. Uh, all of the other modalities, uh, with one exception, um, have uh, diagnostic capabilities, but as soon as those are positive, guess what? You're getting a full colonoscopy, right? right. Um, so a great example and a very popular one now is Cologuard. So Cologuard is uh, great for someone that really doesn't want to submit for a, a full colonoscopy and be sedated, uh, prep for the procedure. Mm -hmm. um, Cologuard is, um, is a stool-based DNA test mm -hmm. combined with a stool uh, chemical test for blood in the stool. So the two of those modalities together and uh, it's an amazing test. Uh, the, the researchers at uh, Exact Biosciences invented this test and uh, showed that the sensitivity when you combine stool DNA and stool blood approach 90% for oh, wow. high-grade cancers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, high-grade polyps and early cancers. So um, it's a wonderful test to screen for those lesions. Um, painless? 
it's painless. Uh, you know, there was a great Saturday Night Live uh, skit on this. Uh, <laughs> you can you can joke around about all this stuff. Google uh, that after we're done. That's right. You'll that's right. But uh, uh, Woody Harrelson. You know. Um, so you know, the point is, um, you know, you do have to just provide a stool sample. Yep. Something you do every day, and sure. um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, taken from there. So uh, if that is positive, though, then you're coming to see me for a colonoscopy. So you. For those who are willing to submit to the process, that's the safe. That's the way to be sure, no matter what. That the colonoscopy is the is the most effective way to do it. Yeah, it's the most sensitive. Uh, meaning, well, if there is something to be found, we'll probably find it on a colonoscopy. Close to one hundred percent sensitivity for cancers. Mm -hmm. uh, for polyps, polyps can be elusive, so you never get a hundred percent of all polyps. But you get in the high nineties with a colonoscopy. Whereas um, all the other modalities. We're dealing with 90% sensitivity down to 70% uh, sensitivity for some of the modalities. So, um, you know, beyond Cologuard, uh, the, uh, the society guidelines do allow for just uh, what's called a, a FIT test, fecal immunochemical testing, which is looking for blood in the stool. Um, so whereas you do a colonoscopy every 10 years, mm -hmm. and you do a Cologuard, which is the DNA and the blood test uh, every three years, a fit test you would do every year. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though it's less sensitive, the increased frequency of testing, um, they feel it's equivalent in terms of screening um, as well. That's a good point, because we did get, uh, again, folks, like I mentioned, a number of questions. One of them was around the frequency of testing, what, what the thought process was behind why things are staged out the way they are. Uh, and so that, that answers that question. The, the, the frequency of that test could help you fill in the gap between the the duration of the others. Exactly, yes. Um, folks, uh, from a general sense, and, and you may have even found out about this particular program through the campaign we're running right now around raising awareness about uh, colorectal cancer, you can find out even more at our website, AtlanticHealth.org. Um, but there is a, a specific site directly for this, AtlanticHealth.org slash colorectal. And you may see the poster uh, behind us here. Uh, it, contains some, some, some facts on there that I want to share right now, and, and Dr. Grossman, interested in your, in your take on these. Um, colorectal cancer being the third most common form of cancer, but as the poster shares, um, while it is also the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths, it's also preventable if you catch it early. Is that true? And, and if so, let's talk a little bit about that. Very much so. Uh, that, that is a true statement. Um, if you uh, find colon cancer at its earliest stage uh, or at its pre-cancerous stage when it is not yet a cancer, um, simple endoscopic resection can, uh, can turn back the clock. Uh, essentially, um, anytime a doctor encounters a polyp, um, they are going to resect it during a colonoscopy. Uh, once that's resected... And resect it, means to remove. To remove it, exactly. We use um, a few different tools, but mainly the one that you should think about is a snare. It looks like a lasso. It's a metal, um, okay. a metal lasso that uh, opens and closes with a technician uh, opening and closing the device. And uh, we kind of uh, strangulate the polyp and remove it. Uh, we can use electricity uh, to prevent bleeding. We can clip close the defect if we need to, but it's a very superficial resection. It's not exactly a surgery um, when you do a simple polypectomy like that. Um, but And it's very quick. Uh, we take the polyp that's been resected, send it to the lab, they look under the microscope. That's when we know, is it still a benign polyp or is there an early stage cancer in there? Um, you know, colonoscopy will eventually, will occasionally find more advanced cancers. Uh, the, the rule is to find t polyps alone in about 25% of all comers. A little higher in men, a little lower in women, mm -hmm. but let's say 25% is the average. So one in four colonoscopies done for screening will have polyps. Uh, cancers are found between a half percent and one percent of all screening colonoscopies. So um, it's not uh, unheard of. There's actually, in our very high volume department, several screening colons per week wow. find cancers. Wow. Um, so when you do find a cancer at a more advanced stage, that obviously is not going to be resectable uh, with, um, with a standard colonoscopy. That's when an oncologist gets involved, that's when a surgeon gets involved, and um, you know, we obviously have the best of those teams. 
And I want, I want to talk about what happens then, but first, recovery time on a polyp on a polypectomy, like in a the kind of thing that would be revealed in a in a regular colonoscopy. How long does it take to recover from something like that? Uh, Ten minutes. Um, we we wow. give um, we give propofol uh, as a standard for uh, sedation. Now our anesthesiologists are present during the procedure. Um, you feel nothing during the procedure. Uh, propofol is a very wonderful drug in that it is an amnestic and an analgesic. Mm. Uh, so when you wake up, you don't even really remember what happened. Um, I've heard folks say it's like the best nap you ever had. It feels like a great nap, yes. It's, um, and uh, really, it takes about 10 minutes for it to wear off, you know, get out of your system. Uh, we ask that you don't drive home, so bring a buddy to drive you. Sure. and. Um, and uh, after that, uh, you really can go about your day. Um, you know, most people take the day off of work as a reward, uh, but the next day you're back at work. 10 minutes, um, quick recovery, uh, and you get the peace of mind of knowing what, what your current situation is. And I, and I want to touch on that a little bit because it, I, I've had conversations like these with, with oncologists who will say one of the biggest challenges is folks sort of don't want to know, right? They kind of just would rather not know. They don't want to go through the screenings. Um, what's your message for folks who are sort of, so full disclosure, I'm turning 45 this year, uh, oh. and, and we can talk a little bit about happy who birthday. needs to get, you know, who <laughs> needs to get these things, but happy colonoscopy birthday, I guess, for me. So um, I guess talk a little bit about this, this sort of syndrome we see from some folks who would just rather not know yeah. and, and what you hear about that. Yeah, so you know, listen, there's a lot of fear um, when when it comes to discussing cancer and, um, but uh, you will find out if you have cancer. Mm -hmm. It will present itself in an ugly way. Um, and this is a part of the body that's not car common parlance for most people. You sure. know, it's not lunchtime conversation. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be serious. We all have colons. Right, mm -hmm. even you, Luke. Even me. Uh, it's uh, so it's um, it, this is a part of the body that's prone to cancer uh, because it's part of our GI tract and um, our diet and our lifestyle in the United States has um, affected the cells that line the colon. Uh, we're all at risk. There's no one that is not at risk for colon cancer. Um, so even though you may choose to remain ignorant to this, um, by doing so, you're putting yourself at a tremendous disadvantage. Modern technology, modern healthcare can prevent colon cancer if you do the screening that's appropriate. So nobody's necessarily immune to it. Are there folks who might be more predisposed to it? You talked about dietary considerations. What are some of the things you want people to think about when they're gauging their own risk factors? Yeah, so, um, you know, first I should say the number one risk factor is age. So everyone is, is at risk because as we get older, our cells have been exposed to more and there's environmental factors that are just part and parlance of being alive in modern society. Um, and we can speculate as to what those environmental factors are, but they are there for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if you're, as you get older, so now the guidelines have been modified so that it's no longer age 50 to begin your colonoscopy experience, but age 45. Um, and this is because we're seeing a shift in more uh, young people being diagnosed with, young, with colon cancer. Mm -hmm. When I was in training, the rule was that only 10% of colon cancers occur in people under age 55, okay? That's pretty rare. So uh, we expect very few people under age 55 to ever present with colon cancer. Now, for whatever reason, the number has shifted to 20% of total colon cancers are occurring in people under age 55. Yeah. This is a, a big shift in the demographic um, and that uh, our society guidelines have changed to reflect that shift and we're now starting in younger people. Uh, it's a real tragedy when you find cancer in a young person. Mm -hmm. They don't expect it, it hits them during their most productive years. Um, they're busy with kids and jobs and lives and. It's, uh, it's never a good time to get cancer, but especially when you're young. Um, so we really, these types of opportunities to discuss uh, are tremendous because if people have certain symptoms as a young person, they need to take those seriously. You can't brush those symptoms under the rug. You need to talk to your doc, tell them you know about colonoscopy, and, and say that you'd like one. Your doc won't turn you down. So we have a couple of questions that, that 
dovetail nicely with the point you just made. Uh, the first one uh, that I want to talk about is from Pamela. Um, she's asking specifically the not, uh, what are the not so obvious signs of colorectal cancer? And she's asking because her mom was diagnosed late in life at 83. So there's a genetic consideration she's thinking about there too. And um, and wants to get ahead of it. Yeah, she she believes in screening. Um, she said uh, she gets screened every five years. But but I guess for her peace of mind and for others who may be watching, what are the obvious signs of colorectal cancer? Okay, so that's a really important question. So um, patients with colon cancer, if they have true malignancy already, the signs that they're going to present with are things like uh, weight loss, right? Involuntary weight loss. Uh, change in bowel habits, that's usually due to a mass effect, meaning the tumor itself is obstructing the bowel partially, sometimes entirely, a blockage. Yeah. You know, blockage. So patients can report that their bowel movements are now uh, kind of changed in caliber, change in size. Mm -hmm. uh, they're less frequent. Uh, they feel constipated at times, bloated. Um, you know, bloating is a symptom of so much else in the GI tract. Uh, that's not a specific uh, symptom. Uh, but um, blood, uh, cancers tend to bleed, uh, whether they are microscopic bleeding or macroscopic bleeding. Any blood, you can't keep it to yourself. Tell someone, tell your doc that you've had bleeding. You know, again, when I was younger, we used to write off most rectal bleeding in young people as hemorrhoidal. Mm -hmm. And uh, hemorrhoids are ubiquitous in our society, but um, the truth is, uh, nowadays, with our knowledge changing about the incidence in young people, we're more likely to perform a, a colonoscopy on someone who reports bleeding that's not exactly, doesn't exactly fit a hemorrhoid pattern. So, um, you know, bleeding, weight loss, um, fatigue, change in bowel habits. Those are our major symptoms. What about the genetic portion of it? Should she be worried because her mom had yes, it? Yes, yes. So, so age is one factor. Genetics is another factor. And those are two things you just can't change, right? You're, right. You are who they you are. are. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, if you have even a single family member with colon cancer, uh, the rules change for you. Uh, if uh, you've had a, a family member who's had colon cancer below age 60, uh, you should begin your screening colonoscopies at age 40. Okay. If that family member was um, younger than 50 when they were diagnosed, you should start your screening colons 10 years before they were diagnosed. Okay. And some of the guidelines are even being modified to say not just colon cancer, but high-grade polyps. If your dad at age 52 had high-grade polyps, meaning polyps with dysplasia under the microscope starting to look like cancer, right? Mm -hmm. um, you should begin your colonoscopy 10 years prior to his polyps uh, being diagnosed. So that would be at age 42 for you. Right. So um, your family history is a tremendous predictor uh, for your colon cancer risk. And um, you got to ask your family, first of all, you need to know the history, um, and then you have to act on it. It uh, should not be a secret if someone in the fam has colon cancer. Excellent. Dr. Grossman, we are out of time, but I appreciate you sharing all this important information. Hopefully, um, you know, we talk about this as I have uh, with you and with others in the past, um, the opportunity to intervene early and save a person's life must, uh, it's a pretty amazing opportunity that science provides us to do today. So thanks for talking to us about it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right, folks. So if you missed any portion of our conversation today, um, you can catch the entirety of this program on our website, AtlanticHealth.org. While you're there, check out AtlanticHealth.org slash colorectal to get all the information about this campaign. We got all kinds of interesting stuff on there too. Uh, there's uh, interactive games you can use on there. There's factual information. There's stuff you can share with others who you think might be interested in this as well. So please go check that out. Um, but you can also find all of our other community conversations there. And we've covered a wide variety of topics. We are in the dozens in terms of counts of numbers of these shows. So maybe this topic wasn't for you, but there definitely is one for you there. So I encourage you to check it out. On behalf of Dr. Grossman, I'm Luke Margold. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Um, so I think um, I'm trying to think about 